I'm happy to announce that Steve Hegwood is our speaker at this time. He's uh, assigned the Psalm 135, giving praise to God. Uh, Steve is a graduate of Freed Hardman University. He has his bachelor's degree and master's degree in New Testament. And uh, we, he is a... Uh, on the faculty of the West Virginia School of Preaching, and uh, we always enjoy having him in class and, and also enjoy hearing him speak in chapel, and we look forward to him speaking to us at this time. Good, e good afternoon. I'll tell you. Been in China the last uh, two weeks, and so they're exactly 12 hours different from us here. And so evening, afternoon, morning are all still kind of jumbled up there a little bit. Uh, but we're getting our bearings back, just kind of a, a shameless plug for the work that's taking place in China. Uh, wonderful work if you have the opportunity to, um, to visit with or to be a part of the work that's going on there. Um, to see the, the Lord's Church growing in a place where... Um, it wasn't before. It's just amazing uh, to see to see hearts open up to the gospel, to things that they've never been able to hear before, and to see lives that are are changing and the church beginning to to bud and to flourish right before your very eyes is a is a beautiful thing. And so, if you have the opportunity to support or to work with uh, the things that are taking place in China, I strongly encourage you. Uh, to, to check into that and to be a part of that. Uh, it is a blessing to be here. It's an honor to, to be asked to speak on the lectureship and, and um, to be able to be with you and to spend this time together. Uh, it is indeed an opportunity we have to praise God. We talk about praising God all the time, and, and, and you hear people say it somewhat flippantly sometimes when something happens, praise the Lord or praise God, and, and they mention that kind of off the cuff, and, and, and it's that concept of praising God that we want to talk about today, and we're going to gain our, our information from the 135th Psalm. The 135th Psalm, you know, most all these Psalms have a background, and all of them kind of have a backdrop, and, and folks have been able to give you a, a, a a good history of the psalm that they're speaking uh, to you from today. I'm not able to do that from the 135th Psalm because it's what we call a mosaic. And mosaic doesn't mean related to Moses. We're not saying that Moses wrote it. What we're saying is it's kind of a, a collection of other psalms that have been brought into a single place. And, and if you have the book, there's kind of a list of some of the verses and the connection they have and, and where they're drawn from, from different psalms, and kind of brought together in, in one place. And, and all these thoughts are kind of combined here in the 135th Psalm. And the very idea is that we are to praise the Lord or to praise our God. And we praise Him for His greatness, for all that He's done and for all that He is. I submit to you that this type of praise, this idea, is exactly what the world was created for. To praise and to glorify the God of the universe. You remember when Jesus is coming in, what some folks call is the triumphal entry, and they're laying the palm branches in front of him, and he's on the borrowed donkey and is on his way into to town to bring this this uh, salvation to Jerusalem, and, and everyone is crying out, uh, "Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest!" And he's rebuked and he's told, tell your disciples to, to stop. Tell them to stop saying this. And he said, if I told them that, don't you understand that if I told them to stop, even the rocks themselves would cry out. And even later, we, we see another account here from, from Matthew. That was from Luke's account, Luke chapter 19 and verse 40. And, and we see also Matthew says later on that the children were repeating this this saying of praise to Jesus. And they told him again, tell these kids to be quiet. And Jesus said, have you never heard out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise? Matthew 21 and verse 16. Just as an aside, let us remember, it's not uncommon for children to repeat what they hear us say. Future generations are going to base their view of the world 
on what they see our generation do and say. The praise of God, the praise of Jesus Christ, is not going to come in the future by accident, but by proper planning and by seeing us praise God in the way that we should praise God. And when they see praise and adoration to the Lord of the universe coming from their fathers and from their grandfathers and from their aunts and uncles and from the men and women at church to whom they are not related, then that praise will continue. But if he's not praised by the generation preceding, he will not be praised by the generations to follow. The praise of God is what the world is meant to do. If I tell my disciples to shut up, the world itself will praise me. The entire world desires to praise Him. Why? Because He's the reason for His existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved across the, the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And God created, God separated the light from the darkness. You see, it was God who in six days spoke everything that exists, and its desire is to return praise to its Creator. <clears throat> Unfortunately, sometimes men stifle that praise, but it ought not to be. The very reason for the existence of the world is to give praise to God. And our psalmist here in the 135th Psalm is telling us to praise Him. And so we want to look at that concept for a few moments today. First and foremost, in order to praise God, we have to understand what it is. And if I were to ask you, how many, I'm not sure what the count is. A preacher's count is about 500 in here today. That's probably not accurate. <laughs> If I were to ask you and, and poll each one of you individually for a definition of the, t of the term praise, we would probably have a different, a variation of, those defin of that definition from every single person in here. And so what I want us to do for just a few moments is to look at the word praise and kind of get us an understanding of what praise really is. According to Webster's Dictionary, praise is to express admiration or give homage to someone or something. In the Greek, now I understand that this is Hebrew, but in the Septuagint, the term here is hexomologia, and we understand, those who know a little bit about the Greek, understand that this is the term typically, typically translated to confess. To confess. This word promotes the idea of public proclamation of a belief in someone. Or something. The Hebrew is Hallel, which simply means to praise. When you accompany Hallel with the term Yahweh, you get Hallelujah. You see, that's the idea. To, to pronounce with your life, with your mouth, and everything that is you, to pronounce this concept that we give praise to God. Praise is the English word, comes from the Latin word pratium, which means price or value. So let's put all this together. The, the, the Hebrew, the, the, the Greek, the concept of confessing or, or proclaiming with our mouth, the, the Hebrew of, of that praise that we give and the idea that it comes from our heart and the Latin word pretum, which means place value on. So praise is bestowing worth or value on someone or something to express that worth or value that you placed in someone or something to others. The ISBE, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, goes a little bit further and talks about some of the mode of praise in which we find ourselves. And I liked their, their treatment of this. And so we're going to look at that a little bit. He's, and, and they say that praise begins with an inward emotion, a, a gladness of heart. That was Jesus' desire, wasn't it? Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. These people draw near to me, he says, with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. He says, what I want them to do, I, I want the praise of their mouth. I want the praise of their lips. But first, I want the praise of their heart. And they missed it. They talked the talk. But their heart's not walking the walk. We cannot properly praise God unless we have that inward joy, that inward uh, love, that inward emotion, that gladness that comes from within us. 
the psalmist in the 33rd Psalm, verse 21. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Stemming from the praise of the heart is the praise of the lips. What comes out of your lips, what comes from your mouth, originates in your heart, doesn't it? The effort of our verbal ability to give praise to God. Psalm chapter 40 and verse 10. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. What's he saying? I have this love. I have this praise. I have this inward emotion uh, within me. This gladness of heart. And I didn't keep it to myself. I proclaimed it forth to other people. Now we're getting to our, closer to our modern day interpretation of this word, right? I wasn't hiding it. I didn't keep it to myself. Oh, there are many people who say, I love the Lord. And they never speak His name to another person. Can that be praise? I suggest to you that it falls short. Such praise is often manifested in song. Not just the speaking, but the singing. And so when we have our worship and we honor God, we sing praise to God. James chapter 5 and verse 13. Is anyone cheerful? What does he say? Let him sing psalms. Or let him sing songs. Finally are the ordered modes of public praise. The beginnings of these are seen in Genesis chapter 4. And you're, you know the story of Genesis chapter 4. Now, humankind has been kicked out of the garden because of what Adam and Eve did. And so they're, they're living outside and, and, and their sons, Cain and Abel, begin to make sacrifice. And remember the story that the two sacrifices were not evil, were not equal. And so uh, Cain got, got jealous and he rose up and he slew his brother. And then comes along Seth. And in Genesis uh, chapter 4, toward the end there, uh, we begin that man begins to, it says, call on the name of the Lord. So the first time we really call on the name of the Lord, there is when Seth made that sacrifice, that ordered, ordered worship. Early on it included somewhat sudden outbursts, as in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 through 21. Uh, you remember that story there. The, the people have now been set free and the, the waters close over on the, the, the uh, armies of Pharaoh that are chasing him. And, and then suddenly Miriam begins to break out in song with the timbrel and the women begin to follow her. And they're all expressing this, this praise and this glory and this honor for what God has just done. He's just set the people free. He's just killed the people who were chasing us. And so they burst forth in praise to God in celebration for what God has done with gladness of heart. Later on, the formation of the Psalter and the skilled musicians of Ezra, chapter 2 and verse 41. To them, musical direction sometimes is given. Then we come all the way forward to Ephesians chapter 5, 19 and Colossians 3 and verse 16, indicating to us the use in New Testament worship, how we incorporate that inward praise and the lips employing the voice and the heart in joyful expression to God in song. Praise belongs to God and He desires it. Augustine said it this way, and I think it couldn't have been said better than this, and if you were forever only servants, you ought to praise God. How much more ought you to praise God then you may hereafter gain the privilege of sons. In other words, if you're going to be a slave to God your entire life, if all you're ever going to be is a slave to the almighty and all-powerful God, you ought to praise God for that privilege. But He's given you the chance to be so much more. He's given you the opportunity not to be called a slave, but to be called His son. How much the more ought you to have gladness of heart and to express that in praise? Why praise the Lord? It's interesting that most of our praise is expressed in song because I believe in the 135th Psalm we find four, four, four fours. Most of our music, at least the music that those of us who don't know much about music can understand, is written in four, four time. 
when you start getting into three, four, and six, eight, you got to be a little bit smarter than some of us, especially guys like me. Four, four is the easiest to understand. And so we're going to talk about four fours today. Four fours that are the reasons why we should express praise to God. Why we ought to praise the Lord of the universe. And the first of those four, the first of those four comes in the, ver the third verse. The 135th Psalm, the third verse. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Well, that sounds simple enough, doesn't it? We praise good things. We like to praise good things. We ought to like to praise good things. The first reason we're given is that the Lord is good. Good in what way? Good in this instance is reference to His character. What do we mean by that? He's good in that He cannot do bad things. He cannot do evil things to His creation. God is good. He's all good. He's all encompassed by good. And He cannot do evil. It was mentioned earlier. He can't tempt us with sin. He can't be tempted with sin. That's not even a part of His character. It cannot happen. God cannot bring about calamity. Oh, you say, but bad things happen. Yes, bad things happen. But God does not bring about calamity upon us. He allows us to be tested. He allows difficult things to happen. But remember, James says, Count it all joy when you fall into trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect result, have its result, that you can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So even the challenges in life are God's way of making us better. God is good. He cannot do bad or evil things to His creation because He is good. Verse 12 is an example of His, of His goodness. He gave to Israel the land as a heritage. He gave to them. He promised it to them and He delivered on His promise. He brought them out of bondage. He brought them out of that evil land in Egypt. A land that started out good for them. A, a land that gave them the opportunity to grow into a, a, a great and a powerful nation. But one that turned bad. One that turned into a, a, a land of slavery. And God said, now it's time for me to get my people out of there. And he sent Moses, of course, and Moses uh, spoke to Pharaoh and said, you need to let God's people go. And, and over the course of time there, he continued to deny, and God sent the ten plagues. And then finally God said, okay, that's enough. And God killed the firstborn, and the people of Israel made their way out, because God made it so. And they wandered for a while because of, uh, because of their own doubt. But they were still able to go into the land that flowed with milk and honey. The land that they witnessed through the eyes of their, of their spies that said, guys, this land is so great. It's so great. The grape clusters are so big that you have to carry them two men on a stick. They're so full and rich. And that land became theirs. The type of care and goodness is further explained by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 32. We get all worried and all in a twist about what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear and what tomorrow's going to look like. And God said, that's in my hands. I've got this. I'll take good care of you. And then Jesus tells this story about a, 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 a boy who asks his dad for a fish. And he says, if your son asks you for a fish, you're not going to give him a snake. And if he asks you for an egg, you're not going to give him a rock. You're evil. And you know how to do good things like this. I'm the good father. If you being evil know how to do things, how much better will I give to you? God cares. God is good. Think about this for a minute. We find in the New Testament this word grace. It seems to be uh, in some ways absent in the Old Testament, although grace was very much a part of the Old Testament, but it wasn't understood that way uh, until we get to the New Testament and Jesus begins to open our eyes to this concept of grace. 
Grace is a word that's bandied about by denominational thought quite often. And those of you who are going to be in my class next Monday, you should be taking notes on what I'm about to say about the word grace. Okay? Grace is the Greek word charis. And according to Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, which is my, in my opinion, is the best Greek lexicon on the market right now, which is actually pretty old. It's not a new word, but the word grace means a beneficent disposition. A disposition is your general character in life, right? The type of person that you are. And beneficent, uh, you, you understand the word benevolent, doing good for others. So grace is this disposition, this general character of God to do good for us. All the aspects of grace, everything that you see re regarding God's grace, come back to this definition. The nature of God is to do good. And because of this goodness, we ought to praise God. His goodness began to benefit us in the very beginning of our existence. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 25. Let us make man in our image. Now, if you look around, you can tell physically we look very different from one another. I bring that point up, although while I was in China, I did find Charles Abbey's twin. I got a picture on my phone I'll show you if you don't believe it. We look very different. Different colored hair. I know all of you are jealous because I have red hair and you don't. What is it about us that's made in the image of God? It's not our physical features. It's not our stature. If it were so, then John Keith, I, one of us is missing something, buddy, because you're a lot taller than I am. What is it? You see, it's the part of us behind our eyeballs, isn't it? It's the soul of man. Here's how good God is. He provides for us physically. But He provided for us beyond that. He said, I know. Stephen Haywood, you short little fat preacher, I know one thing's going to happen to you. You're going to mess this up. You're going to sin somewhere along the way. You're going to do something that's going to cause me, despite my best efforts and despite my love for you, it's going to cause me to, to put you in a place where, where you'll be condemned because of what you've done to yourself. But I don't want you to stay there. And I'm going to do something to win you back. And that's when John 3.16 comes in. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. God should be praised because of His goodness. He demonstrated His own goodness to man when He created us with the ability to think and to be saved. The second four. The second beat in our 4-4 four, four measure. Okay? You know in a 4-4 four, four measure, you have to have all four beats to have the full measure. And so we're trying to get the full measure of, of why we ought to praise God. The second beat. Beat number two. We got the down beat. Now we're going across, right? Beat number two. What is it? For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for a special treasure. The psalmist here clearly says the Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth in the sixth verse of our text. He can act in whatever way he wants. Why? Because it's his creation. You ever do that as a child, make up a game? I did that a few times. And I'll tell you what, I made up this game and the game had my rules. And here's how it usually went. As long as I was winning... Right? Those rules stayed in place and they were immutable. But when I started losing, those rules kind of got tweaked a little bit. And I could do that. Why? Because it's my game. I'm going to win. God can act however He wants because it's His world. He made it. 
He whirled up the dust. He made the stones. He made the, the water. He made all that is this world. In all this, he can act however he wants. In fact, in Genesis chapter 5, uh, chapters 5 through 7, you remember he sent water and drowned out every single living thing that displeased him and started all over. And he chose Jacob to himself. He established a peculiar people through Jacob in the nation of Israel, and they became a powerful treasure to the Lord. Jacob had an inauspicious start, didn't he? You see, Jacob was the second son. He wasn't the first. His brother Esau was born first, only by a little bit, but it was by enough. All it took was to be the first one out of the womb to get all of the benefits of being the first child. He was the second one, but he stole his brother's birthright. You see, you understand the word Jacob means the one who supplants or takes the heel of. He took the heel of his brother. He supplanted his brother in that place of, of, of being the first. Esau came in, was tired. He said, man, I'm hungry. Jacob had a pot of, of lentil stew there. I'll tell you what, to sell my birthright, it's going to take more than lentils. <laughs> Esau comes in, I'm starving. Can I have a bowl of your soup? Well, if you trade your birthright for it, what good is it if I starve to death? So he traded with him. Birthright. What does that mean? It means now, instead of Esau getting two-thirds of the inheritance, Jacob gets it. Jacob gets two-thirds, and Esau only gets a third. That's a tremendous difference. Through cunning and deceit, then he fooled his dad. Walked in there and, and put the fake hair on his arm and got his dad's blessing. So he was now not only going to get the major part of the inheritance, but now he was going to be the patriarch, the leader of the family. Yet God selected him and turned him into a value. God can do what he wants to do. He did something similar to a man named Saul. You remember Saul. We find him in Acts chapter 7, verse 58 through 9, 31. Saul started out breathing threats and murder, holding the clothes of those, the coats of those who would throw rocks at Stephen to kill him because of his proclamation of his faith in Jesus Christ. He gets letters to go up to Damascus to drag these Christians off and, and to bring them into this, this place so that they could be punished for their faith in Jesus. That's who Saul was. God appeared to him on the road. You remember that bright light and he blinded him. And he said, you go into the city uh, and it'll be told there what you must do. God told Ananias, I got Saul there waiting for you. And Ananias said, whoa, time out. Can I just talk to you about something for a minute, Lord? I know who Saul is. I know what he's doing. And I'm not sure I really want to go talk to him. And God said, you go talk to him because he's a chosen vessel. He went to him, proclaimed to him, Jesus Christ. The scales fell from his eyes and immediately, now he's been in town, in this house, for three days, fasting and praying. That means he hasn't eaten a bite in three days. I don't know about you, we had a good meal over here. Uh, within about four or five hours, I'm looking forward to another good meal. And if I make it to this time tomorrow and haven't eaten again, I'm eating something. So the logical brain says the scales fall from his eyes. The first thing you do is get up and make a sandwich. Get you something to eat. First thing he did was to get up and to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. Then he went and got something to eat. He took care of the spiritual first. You understand the transformation that happened in this man? He was doing everything he could to defeat Jesus Christ. Now, he's doing everything he can to promote the cause of Christ. What a radical transformation. What a change of heart. That's the beauty of God's Word, isn't it? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Let's talk about that word power for just a minute. One of the definitions of Webster for the term power is control or influence. 
Another way to look at this concept of influence is the ability to affect change on something. Power. The gospel, God's word, is his power to change human beings. How does that power work? John chapter 2. A simple text, a text that we sometimes uh, try to make arguments for one way or the other. Was this alcoholic wine? Was it non-alcoholic wine? I submit to you that it was non-alcoholic wine that Jesus made. I don't think that he would have made a bunch of inebriating uh, uh, substance for a bunch of people who were getting drunk. Okay, That is completely outside of the good nature of God. You want to have some discussion about it? We'll talk about it. But that's not the point of the story, is it? Here's the point of the story. He took six water pots that each held at least 20 gallons. That's 120 gallons of water at a minimum. They put water into the water pots and they pulled out the best wine they'd ever had. The very best. God changed in an instant. Now imagine this. I'm not going to guess how much you weigh, and I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh. The human body is about 60% water. How much water does that mean is held in? You take your, take your body weight and, and divide it and, and multiply it by 0. 0.6 or divide it, you know, figure out how it works. That's how much water is in you. If God can change in an instant 120 gallons of water to the greatest wine they'd ever had, what can He do with you? God should be praised because of His ability to transform me from such a wretched being as I was, mired in sin, the filth and garbage that Satan tempted me to take into myself. And what God turned me into, because of His goodness, His grace, God should be praised for the change that He made in me. 3, 4. We're to the third note. And we're running out of time quickly. The Lord is great. The greatness of the Lord in this instance is in reference to this power that He had. Not just the transformative power, but His overall power. God was the one who spoke in six days and everything came into existence. The prophet Isaiah pointed out the folly, and the text is written there in the, in the book, if you look at that, the folly of those who would believe in uh, this concept of idols. He said, you build this idol. He said, you, you take an oak, or you take a cypress, or you take a pine tree, and you cut it down, and, and out of one end of it, you, use fire to, you make fire to warm yourself. Out of one end of it, you make fire to cook with, and out of the other end of it, you fashion a god. And you bow yourself down to it. And you give homage to this God that you've made with your own hands. You whittled with a knife and with wood shaping tools. It has eyes, but it cannot see. It has a mouth, but it cannot speak. It has ears, but it cannot hear. I would add to that the concept of hands and feet. But it can't go anywhere or do anything. It cannot act, he says, of its own will. But people bow before it. Let me give you the old uh, Tennessee boy rendition of this. God made man in sticks. The created man took the created sticks and made gods to supplant the creating God. But the creating God can hear with his ears, see with his eyes, and act with his own will on the creation, while the created God has nothing beyond man-made aesthetics to, and looks to offer. In fact... The remaining materials of the created God serve no purpose in fuel for the fires for man's physical needs. God made all this stuff. We put it together and we worship it like it's something special. But it's nothing. God causes the vapors to ascend. Psalm 137 verse 5. Reference to the water cycle. 
to how, to how all things work. We have all this water and God has it designed so that it will evaporate and it will go back up into the clouds and, and they'll form together and get heavy enough and they drop rain back down to replenish the earth so that we have water for our gardens and our fruits and our vegetables to feed the animals that we're going to eat. This reminds me of a story. Elijah went up on the mountain with the prophets of Baal. You remember the story? And they each one made their own altar. And so the, the prophets of Baal, they've got this altar, and there's a bunch of them, and they're all coming around. And, and, and Elijah said, you, if you can get your God to, to bring fire down and to consume that altar, we'll see, and we'll see then if mine can, if yours can. So they, they make this altar and they begin to go around it and they're, and they're making noise and they're crying out and they begin to cut themselves and, and he's not listening. Oh, Elijah, you know, he, he couldn't, couldn't help but have a little, a little bit of sport with him. He said, well, maybe he's just asleep. You need to be a, longer, a little louder. Or, or maybe he went away on a journey or maybe it's time for him to sit down and eat and he just don't have time for you right now. Maybe you need to be a little louder. Oh, boy, they took the challenge. And nothing happened. Baal didn't respond because he didn't exist. And it was Elijah's turn. He built the altar. He said, dig a trench. Boy, they put a trench around there, and they started boring water on it. Cover that thing. I want it dripping wet. He didn't have to make any real big scene, did he? He prayed to God. Show them your power. And the fire from God came and consumed the sacrifice, the altar, the water. It was dry. The power of God is a thing to be praised. To be held in high esteem because of what He does. Psalm 135, verses 8 through 11. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst of you. O oh, Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants, he defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sion of the Amorites, Og, the king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. No matter who it was that the people of God went out against, when God was with them, God won. God should be praised because of His mighty power. Finally, 4-4. Four, four. The last note in the measure. Bringing it all together now, the fourth four is found in the 14th verse of the 135th Psalm. For the Lord will judge His people and He will have compassion on His servants. The Lord has seen fit to punish people for their disobedience. Don't misunderstand what this verse is saying. The Lord has seen fit to punish disobedience and will see fit in the future to punish disobedience. God's wrath is real. Understand that. Even in the very beginning, Adam and Eve had it made in the garden with God. But they were cast out because of their sin. When they were cast out, they were removed from there. God still made provisions for their existence. He was still with them in some way. He still wants and desires that relationship that He has with us. And He punishes His disobedience, but He has compassion on our distress. But as for his own servants, he has mercy upon them and returns them in love after he has, in the truest affection, smitten them for their iniquities. That's what Charles Spurgeon says. I don't agree with a lot of what Charles Spurgeon says. But I think he's right on this one. The basic cycle of life for Israel and their relationship with God was something like this. Obedience. Apostasy, discipline, repentance, restoration, and then another generation of apostates. And in every situation, God did something to win them back. It could be summed up, really, in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. 
The Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raising cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot. You shall not have a man. So too will I be towards you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. You see, that's how the relationship of God is. Hosea loved Homer. Homer was a roamer. She liked to find love in the arms of other men. But Hosea still loved her. And he paid the price to get her back, even though she didn't deserve his love anymore. And he loved her. And he said, Please stay with me. Don't roam anymore. Be my bride and let me love you. And that's the plea of God to us. Let me love you. Don't roam anymore. Make no mistake. If we die away from God, we shall be away from God for eternity. But also know that that is not what God wants. That is not what He provided for. That's not why He made the sacrifice of His Son. He made the sacrifice of His Son for one reason and one reason alone. And that was to save you. And for that, for that reason alone, we ought to praise the Lord. The psalmist encourages and even insists that the reader praise the Lord. Praise is the use of the heart, the body, and the mouth uh, to begin to both spontaneously and through ordered fashion bring about the adoration and the praise of God to express the value that we have placed on Him. The Lord is the object of the praise of men, and He is worthy of such. He's worthy of such because of His goodness, that grace by which He has offered us the hope of everlasting life. He deserves our praise because He chose us in a very special way as He chose Israel. Even though we sin, He tempered His judgment with mercy. The Lord is worthy of praise because He is great. Not just good, and His nature, but great in His power and majesty. Imagine another power in the universe that can bring men back from the dead. There's not one. There's not another power in the universe that can bring us back. He's worthy because of His power and His majesty. He created the world and everything in just six days and on the seventh day He rested. He maintains control over all things and has the ability to change wretched men from sinner to saint. He is praiseworthy because of His immense love for God. Despite the wickedness of sinful man, He sent Jesus to die in our place, to taste death once for all. Unbelievable power, grace, mercy, and love. The best object for praise that man could ever know. And so I finish with the words of the psalmist as he finishes in, in the 21st verse. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Steve, for that powerful lesson. Uh, we stand adjourned till uh, 2.15. Thank you.